Uh, we have Jorge Aparicio. He's going to be presenting on um, Rusty Robots. It uh, went through the slides. It's really very cool. So please give him a warm welcome. Uh, thank you. Um, we don't have as much time I would like, uh, so we'll dive in right into... Yeah, sure. Can you hear me at the back? Yes? No? no. no? <laughs> Should I shout? Yeah. Okay, I will shout. Uh, <laughs> okay, so this is the robot, and this is the front view. And you can see it's a wheel robot, and only has two wheels. And the mess of wire on the top is the electronics that will control it. And there's a cortex in my control in there among other things, and this is the side view. You can see it only has two wheels, no extra support point, and the robot is clearly unstable. It doesn't matter which position uh, you put it on, it will always fall to either side. <laughs> and this is uh, similar to a common problem in control theory, which is the inverted pendulum problem. And in that problem, we have an inverted pendulum on top of a moving car, which you can move using this force F. Now, the pendulum will fall due to gravity, and to compensate that falling uh, action, what you have to do is, if the pendulum is moving to the left, then you also have to move the car to the left to compensate. So the problem boils down to picking a force F that according to the field angle theta that you see there. Okay, so we'll need to find that uh, field angle. And for that, we have an accelerometer on the robot. And as the name implies, an accelerometer measures uh, proper acceleration. And the sensor I'm using is the MPU-9250. Now, how do I get uh, the till angle uh, from the acceleration? And accelerometers, even when they are not moving, they always sense the acceleration of the gravity. And on the picture on the left, you see that the sensor is horizontal. And in that case, uh, the accelerometer is going to indicate that the acceleration across the x and y axis are zero. But across the z axis is one times the gravity, or 1g. And that's going to be a field angle of zero degrees. And now on the right, you see that I have tilted the sensor by some angle. And in that case, the reading across the y and z axis are going to be non-zero. And if you do some trigonometry there, you'll find out that the angle is the arctangent of the ratio of the y and z components. And let's see how that works out in practice. This is data collecting from the accelerometer uh, when it's uh, horizontal and it's not moving. On the top, you see the acceleration across the y and z axis. And the data is noisy. And at the bottom, uh, you see the r tangent formula from before. And that's going to be the field angle. And the angle is around 2.9 degrees. And that makes sense since the sensor is horizontal. It should be near 0. Now, what happens if I start moving the accelerometer? And this data is from moving the accelerometer on a horizontal table. So in that case, the field angle should still be 0 because I'm not uh, tilting the sensor. But what we see here is that once you compute the angle using the formula from before, you get a lot of oscillations. And this is clearly wrong. And the problem is that the formula from before was assuming that the only acceleration measured by the sensor was the gravity. And that's not going to be the case as soon as you start moving the sensor. Now, the accelerometer is not enough to get us uh, that angle. So we also have a gyroscope on the robot. And a gyroscope measures the angular rate, or the speed at which uh, the sensor is rotating. And this is perfect, because with this, we can measure exactly how the angle is changing. And the same uh, sensor from before has both an accelerometer and a gyroscope. Again, this is data from the sensor, uh, horizontal and without moving. At the top, you have uh, the angular rate. And at the bottom, you have the till angle, which you can get from integrating the top uh, signal. And you see there that the angle says that it's increasing uh, as time goes by. And that's wrong because the sensor is horizontal. And the problem here is that the gyroscope says that the angular rate is non-zero. And that's common in this kind of sensors, and it's called bias. And the offset in the measurement is called bias. And what you have to do is calibrate the sensor by removing the bias. And this is the, the data once uh, the sensor has been calibrated. And now the angular rate is around 0. And once you compute the integral at the bottom, the angle is also around 0, which is the correct uh, result you want. Now, the accelerometer and gyroscope have problems on their own. But what you can do is combine both measurements using a technique called sensor fusion to get a better estimate of the angle. And there are many ways to do sensor fusion, but a Kalman filter is appropriate in this case. 
Now we're going into the details of the math behind Kalman filters, but I should say that they are not actually filters, but they are system state estimators. Um, for this Kalman filter, I have chosen a state of the thin angle and also the gyroscope bias. And here we see a simplified interface to the Kalman filter it has submitted some uh, tuning parameters from here. And the filter has to start with some initial state, which is the angle and the gyroscope bias. And then every time we have a new measurement, we are going to update this filter. And what the filter will do is try to predict the next <coughs> state using its previous state, and then we'll compare that to the measurements from the gyroscope and the accelerometer, and use that information to get a better estimate of the angle. And this is what the Kalman filter looks like in action. Uh, again, this is data from the sensor, horizontal, without moving. And the blue dots are the thin angle computed only using accelerometer data. And the green line is the Kalman filter. And both say the same thing, that the angle is around 2.9. But the difference is that the Kalman filter has much less noise in it. It has one order of magnitude less noise. Now we have another example where I move the sensor from a position of 0 degrees to 90. And the blue line is the angle from only the accelerometer, and green line is the Kalman filter. As you can see, the Kalman filter, you see, it has a smooth transition from 0 to 90. But the accelerometer has oscillations uh, along the whole transition. But we're using the Kalman filter here. OK, now we have the angle, and we have to move the motors to be able to stabilize the robot. And for that, uh, we use this uh, piece of electronics called H-bridge. And this model has two H-bridge, and we can use that to control the two motors on the robot. And with the H-bridge, we can control the direction of the motor. Uh, and H-bridge basically is just four switches arranged, as you see on the screen. And on the left, we have one of the possible states of the H-bridge. And in that state, the power supply is applied to the motor, and that will apply some voltage and make the motor move. And in the state on the right, uh, the voltage is also going to be applied to the motor, but with reverse polarity. That will make it spin in the other direction. So it has four switches, and you could get 16 different possible states from that. But uh, in practice, we only use four states. The two you see there, and the other one is when you have everything open and the motor is disconnected uh, from the power supply. And the other state is when you short circuit the motor by, say, closing the two switches at the bottom, and that will make the motor break, so it will stop almost immediately. And with edge bridge, you can also control the speed of the motor, which we are going to need uh, in this robot. And we can do that using this technique called pulse width modulation. And the main idea is that instead of having the motor connected to the power supply the whole time, we are going to connect it just for 75% of the time, say. And the other 25%, we are going to leave it disconnected. This is going to transfer less power into the motor, which will make the spin slower. So this ratio between the on time and the total time is called the duty cycle, and it can go from 0 to 100%. And so 100% will make the motor spin at full speed, and 0 will make it stop. Now we have the two pieces. Uh, we have the angle, and we can control the motor. So how can we pick a duty cycle to stabilize the robot? We can use this PID controller. And there, in this diagram, the process on the right is the robot, and the variable Y is the till angle measure. And on the left, we have this variable R, which is the set point, which is the angle we want the robot to be at. So if we pick something like 0, that will make the robot stay uh, upright. And the difference between those two is the error. And that error is going to be scored by these three PAD gains. And it's going to turn into this control variable u, which is the duty cycle we apply to the motor. And now uh, everything here is going to be computed at runtime, except for the PAD gains. So it has to be selected before uh, running the <coughs> PID controller. So if we pick the right uh, gains for the PID controller, then we get something like this. We get uh, a stable system. The robot no longer falls. And here we have uh, data from that previous video. And you can see that uh, at, the, at the top, we have the thin angle measure and the blue line. And the green line is the set point we chose. And in this case, it was 10 degrees. And the action of the PID controller is going to try to stabilize uh, the thin angle. So it will try to match the set point. At the bottom, you can see the duty cycle uh, chosen by the PID controller. And there, a negative value means that the motor reverses uh, its orientation. 
But that's not the only possible outcome if you are uh, trying to guess what the correct PID gains are. So if you don't show them uh, correctly, you will get something like this, an unstable system. <laughs> and what you got there is oscillatory behavior. So instead of having the till angle uh, converge to the set point, you get this oscillation uh, around the set point. And well, that's something you don't want. So let's continue with the stable PID gains. So before we have an stable system, but the robot didn't move. But at the end, we want to be able uh, to move the robot. So what should we do uh, to move the robot like this, for example? And the only thing we have to do is change the set point. So before, it was 10 degrees, and that gave us almost no motion. But choosing a value of 4, in this case, uh, is going to make uh, the robot move. So at the top, we see, uh, again, the till angle stabilizes around the set point. And at the bottom, we have the PID. Uh, output, which is the duty cycle, which stabilizes, but this time it stabilizes to a non-zero value, and that gives us uh, a speed uh, on the motor. And a value less than 10 gives us a forward motion, and if we show a value larger than 10, that will give us a backward motion. Okay, so at this uh, point of the talk, you are wondering, okay, this is cool and all, but wasn't this talk about rust? Uh, so now let's talk about uh, how Rust helped uh, uh, build this kind of application. And in this diagram, you see the microcontroller in the center, and the other components are the external components to which the microcontroller is connected to. And each edge in this graph is one of the microcontroller pins. And the direction of the edge indicates whether the pin is configured as an input or as an output. And the label indicates what the functionality of that pin is. And the bottom line here is that you want to configure everything correctly, otherwise your system will not work. And you will have a hard time figuring out what is not working. And ROS can help here uh, if you design your API like something like this. And uh, in this program, we are going to set up a serial interface. And for that, we need to use two pins, a transmission pin, TX, and a reception pin, RX. Now, and the first line, we are going to take all the peripherals of the microcontroller into the current scope. And on the second line, we are going to take just one peripheral, which is the GPIO A, which is in charge of configuring the pins of the microcontroller. And we are going to split that into 16 independent pins. Now, the first line uh, is going to change the pin PA9 into, is going to put it into alternate push-pull output mode. And that pin we are going to use for the TX pin. And important to note here is the type of the TX uh, variable. And then you can see the pin name, PA9, but you also have this parameter inside, which is, says alternate push-pull. And that's the state the pin is in. And this technique of putting the state of your uh, some value into the type is called a uh, type state. And the line number four we have uh, simply assign the pin PA10 to the RX uh, variable. And we have, again, the name of the pin in the type, PA10, but the state is different. It's in input mode. And the next thing we do is we create, we create a serial interface. And to create that, we pass both TX and RX by value. Now, this constructor is uh, written in such a way that if you haven't configured your pin correctly in the right mode, then this won't compile, because it has to have a specific uh, type to be uh, passed here. And that means that you cannot do the configuration incorrectly, because then your program won't compile. And another thing you get here is that, for example, the last line tries to change the mode of the RX pin into output mode. And that will break the serial extraction, because the serial extraction expects that pin to be in input mode. But you cannot do that in this, uh, with this API, because when you construct the serial abstraction, you pass TX and RX by value. So now the serial abstraction owns both pins, and you cannot configure them to be any other thing. And one other thing uh, ROS helps with is uh, generic drivers. So the microcontroller has to interface this external component, which is the uh, accelerometer and gyroscope. So instead of writing code or a driver that lets my microcontroller interface with that component, I chose to write uh, the driver using generic programming so that it can work with different platforms. And the key here uh, with generic programming are traits, which you can see 
and this SPI uh, type parameter. It is bound by these two traits, and these traits are interfaces. And they basically say, you can construct this driver if you pass me this type which implements this SPI interface. And that means that as long as I provide a type that implements the interface, then it could be implemented for a microcontroller or for a Raspberry Pi. This driver doesn't care about that, about those details. So this driver can be reused across different uh, devices or platforms. And now, so the community is putting together this embedded HAL project where we have uh, is just a bunch of traits which represent different uh, abstractions you have and embedded uh, systems, which are CR interface, SPI, I2C bus. And the ultimate goal here is code reuse. So as I mentioned before, a uh, driver author simply writes uh, the driver using these traits. And they will support any platform that implements these traits. And they don't have to write any platform-specific code. And the benefit for the developers who are uh, targeting some platform is that once they implement these embedded HAL traits, they get for free all the generic drivers that are built upon that. And right now, we don't have uh, many drivers published on crates.io, but the community is working together to get a lot of them uh, out uh, this year. And the communication module is uh, one module where Rust uh, really shined. And I'm using this module uh, for communicating wirelessly between the robots and my laptop or my phone. And this module uh, accepts a serial interface from the microcontroller, which is a simplified interface. So then the microcontroller doesn't have to implement the Bluetooth stack. Now, I use this mainly to log data from the robot, so then I can analyze that later on. And this model is uh, limited to a communication speed of around 10 kilobytes per second, and I want to log data really fast. So I have to show a format that will let me uh, do that. And I chose a binary format, just directly translates all the types into binary format. But in my application, I didn't have to write any binary serialization uh, functionality. Instead, I simply grab uh, this bioarray crate from crates.io, and I use that to serialize the data into an array. And now this works, and I can send data in binary format to my laptop. But there is a problem, because this is a wireless link. Uh, data might be dropped uh, if the robot set gets too far away. So to solve that problem, I can add uh, frame delimiters to my data uh, before sending that. And for that, I'm going to use this COPS frame uh, crate, which is also on crest.io. And this algorithm basically adds a uh, frame delimiter, which is usually zero, and then translates uh, the rest of the data so it doesn't have any zero in there. And it both provides a way to encode and decode the frame. And once I had that, then my data was properly frame delimited. But then I started wondering, could it be that I lose some uh, bytes, bytes and I still get a valid frame on the laptop and I will still get a uh, young data out of that? So I added a checksum to my data to verify that the frame is actually uh, what I wanted to send. And again, I didn't implement that in my application. I simply grab a uh, checksum crate from crates.io, in this case, the CRC16. And here you can see the full code. I uh, serialize my data, then compute the checksum, append that, and then turn that into a COPS frame and put that on the wire. And one of the uh, last parts is concurrency. So I have to do multitasking on the microcontroller. And I only have to do these two tasks. And for that, I use this real-time for the masses, or RTFM uh, framework. And it lets me uh, do a task on top of inner handlers. So it's basically a hardware-based scheduler. So it's, it's really fast and efficient. But since it's Rust, I don't have to worry about data races. So I have these uh, two tasks. Uh, one was periodic, where I read the sensors, update my camera filter, update the PAD controller, and then log the data. And then I have this other kind of asynchronous task, where uh, my laptop sends some data to the microcontroller, and I used that to change the PAD gain, because I was uh, manually tuning uh, the gains. And when you use uh, inner handlers, then, and you need to share data between them, then you have to use uh, static variables. And static variables are troublesome, one, because they, you might run into data races. But I think a major problem uh, from my point of view is that 
they make the code uh, not readable because then anything can modify the variable, so you don't know who has access to the variable. But with this uh, framework, uh, we have this declarative app macro where you define all your resources, which are nothing else than static variables, and then you declare your task and you assign the resources to the task. So then when you're writing the task body, which is at the bottom, then task task only has access to the resources it was declared uh, in the app macro. And if you try to access any other resource that wasn't declared uh, for that task, uh, you will get a compiler error. And the framework also takes care of if you have sh sharing between uh, a resource is shared between two tasks, and the framework will take care of uh, ensuring that the access is uh, free of data erasers. And for example, the R is task uh, at the bottom to access the PID uh, resource, which is shared, it has to use a lock to achieve uh, data race freedom. Okay, some uh, other random stuff. Uh, the CPU uses of the migrant order was around 21%. Uh, the CPU was running at 64 megahertz and it had no FPU and the control loop was running around 500 uh, times per second. Um, binary size, my application was around uh, what, uh, 400 lines of code, excluding the code from the dependencies. Everything that ended in the binary came from uh, raw source code and the binary size was around 8.5 kilobytes in flash. And actually, two kilobytes of that are due to software emulation of float arithmetic because I don't have an FPU. RAM uh, was uh, 140 bytes, and I didn't use any dynamic memory allocation. Uh, at the bottom, you can see the, the biggest uh, symbols, and among them, you will find this software emulation of IEEE floats. Uh, finally, this is uh, the dependency graph of the project. It has around 20 dependencies. Uh, excluding build dependencies, so there's a lot of code reuse in there. Uh, one thing I found scary is that most of those traits have been written by me, except for like three or four. But if you were writing this, then you don't have to do uh, all the work of writing the dependencies. Okay, in conclusion, uh, ROS is small enough so it can fit in a microcontroller. It's also performant enough that you can implement this time-sensitive control system uh, on a resource-constrained device. It's also memory safe. You can do multitasking uh, without uh, having to care about data races or worry about that. It also lets you write more correct code. As we saw in the pin configuration, you cannot get it wrong with the API. You can also easily use third-party code, which we use a lot in the communication module. And it's also good for code reuse. We have uh, this generic driver, which can be used in many different platforms. And that's all I have. Thank you. Have time for questions? Yes. How easy was it to cross compile the code for that target? Uh, so, Rust is already a cross compile. Oh, yes. Uh, the question was how, how was it to cross compile to that target? Uh, so, the thing is that the Rust compiler is already a cross compiler by default. So, I didn't uh, need to do anything special. I could already generate machine code for the ARM context uh, microcontroller. The only external tool tool that I needed was a linker because ROSC doesn't include a linker inside. So I use uh, LD, ARM known ABI, LD, and then that was the only external dependency I had. Any other questions? Over here. What was your background before you made this? Uh, the question is, what's my background uh, for doing this? Uh, and actually, I have a bachelor in mechatronics engineering. And yeah, basically I took like several semesters of control theory, so this is the kind of stuff we do there. Yes, at the back. Yes, you. Okay. Okay, uh, the question is, uh, so this was using a Cortex in microcontroller. How hard will it be to support uh, other architectures and also all other microcontrollers, right? Yeah, mostly just the other Cortex. Okay. Okay, only about the uh, Cortex in microcontroller. And so 
To get uh, more device support, we have a tool called SVD to RAS, which uh, so vendors give us this description of all the register in a microcontroller in this SVD format, which is a final stand XML uh, file. And we can translate that into ROS code that lets us use all the registers of the microcontroller. So that gets like 90% of the work done. And if you have the SVD file for a microcontroller, then basically you can already do I.O. and use the registers. And on top of that, you will want to build something uh, slightly higher level, uh, because manipulating the register can be error prone. And for that, we have these embedded HAL traits. And if you implement a HAL that uses that interface, then it's like the 10% of the job left. And once you do that, then you get access to these generic drivers. Uh, right now, uh, people are mainly using STM32 microcontrollers. I have seen some people using like NXP, LPC, and a bit of uh, SAM from APR. And, but the boards that have uh, most support are the blue pill, which is the one I use here, and uh, a few of the discoveries. Yes. Is there another question? Uh, not actually a question, but if uh, anyone is interested in robotics, we're going to have a, a virtual trailer in about 30 minutes. So if you are a roboticist or just love robots, uh, see you there. Thanks. Thanks.